screen to accept. Um, if you do that, I am going to turn it over to Susie from Oregon State University. Great. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, hopefully your weather in your part of the woods is doing well. We've got um, freezing rain and snow today. So I was just checking up on what was happening in Ohio. As the, that's where I'd grown up in 4-H in. Um, I've been here with, um, well, hi, Victor. Um, I've been here in Oregon for... Um, couple of decades. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, and this is a presentation about programming that we've done in um, Polk County. Polk County, if you're familiar with the state of Oregon, it's just due west of Salem, the state capital. Um, we're about 20 miles from the state capital. Um, it has a combination of both urban with the West Salem, as well as very remote rural. We have a number of folks who are off grid. We also have um, a very large population of homeschooled families. So um, part of what I ran into was the challenge of too many kids who wanted to be in 4-H and we didn't have club openings. So what do you do? Um, and we also had an enrollment deadline that made it that after um, originally, uh, um, when I first came to the county, it was actually March 1st, and our fair isn't until August. And so, you know, March 2nd, I'd have to say, um, well, you're you're too late to join this year, but you can always join and help out the club and, you know, come do barn duty with the kids and get to know um, the other kids within your group, et cetera, et cetera. And we needed something to be able to um, share with these kids and to be able to get them involved before we lose them to other youth serving organizations. And as you know, um, other youth organizations are able to get you into a Cub Scout meeting or a Girl Scout meeting within um, many times within the week, but certainly within the month. And um, I felt that just was not um, a, acceptable for us to have to turn them away without having something to offer. So goals of what I want to talk about today um, kind of help you to understand how we set up the STEP program, STEP being short-term educational programs in our county. Um, we'll talk about um, some of the benefits of including STEP programming. Um, I'll also give you um, some of the challenges and some of the not so pretty sides to it. Um, and also give you some ideas of how we've been able to use STEP to be able to fill in the gaps in our enrollment. If we don't have um, a club leader in a particular area, then we've been able to use the STEP to be able to fill those in. Um, as I indicated, I've been around a while. Um, I actually started in Seattle King County as a program assistant back in the mid 80s. And we had 4-H pep clubs there where we worked with kids in housing um, developments to be able to get them involved with short-term projects uh, within the 4-H program. Then I came to Oregon and Lincoln County's on the coast, um, Newport, and there we had um, summer day camp programs. So they had a theme each week um, and they were related within the projects and we called that Kid Quest. And we had it during um, days off school, like President's Day, Spring Break Week, those kinds of things. And then uh, Lane County, which is Eugene, this had a, a very mixed rural and urban um, county that we met with and worked with. And there um, with the focus group came up with calling it Fast Track 4-H. Um, and we had a, a, seeing how Eugene is Track Town USA, we ended up with a Converse tennis shoe with a 4-H um, clover on it was our logo for that program. And then um, Polk County, we started developing this one in um, the early 2010s, um, and it goes on through today. Um, so we've got a history with those. Um, last year's program, just to give you an idea of what we're looking at for um, membership and enrollment, 
Um, and these numbers are way down with ha having had COVID and, and all of what we dealt with. But typically, we're usually pushing um, six to 700 in the club-based program. And we've had a high of 600 in the step participants. This year, we had 370 day camp programs. Um, the other staff person who works with day camping was uh, left midpoint this last year in um, July. So I was unable to um, have a lot of our day camps that we've typically had. <clears throat> and then you'll see we've been able to involve a large number of older youth in leadership roles along with our adult volunteers. Now, um, our episodic volunteers who come in and just teach one class, I have not been enrolling them as leaders. So just to clarify that um, of how that was about. Um, one of the things that I've always used whenever I've had problems in the county um, or needed some a wide group of, of opinions on a particular situation, I've always utilized focus groups and, and think tanks to be able to figure out how to deal with um, different issues. And one of the things when I first started in the county, our leaders association was um, made up with of folks who'd been on the committee for 10, 15, in some cases 30 plus years. And they really weren't interested in doing much beyond their leaders association role. So um, we ended up creating a new committee known as the Visionary Advisory Council. And at first, when we first developed it and got going with it, um, I purposefully came up with that name so that it would be kind of a unique um, and more of a, I guess, quote unquote, prestigious uh, title for them so that um, it would be something they want to be a part of. And we, I handpicked um, that focus group that looked at this challenge of, of placing kids um, within the program. I had new leaders, older leaders. I had um, older youth who'd been in the program since Cloverbud years. Um, I also had kids that weren't in the 4-H program that I invited along. Um, I work with our family resource centers and had been doing leadership classes um, with their their teen advisory board. So I had access to a lot of kids that weren't in the 4-H program. So we asked them to come in and, and be a part of it. Um, and I had other folks who um, are part of other youth service organizations. Um, some of the churches that have rather large um, older youth leadership groups, um, Boys and Girls Club, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, FFA was involved. So um, really pulled in a very diverse group of people to look at um, what was happening in the program. And I've continued to use them over the years for various um, challenges that we may be faced with um, to be able to use them kind of as that think tank to be able to um, pick their brain on, on their ideas of what might work. And I would say, yes, it does take a little longer, but um, they have more ownership when they're part of that decision-making and part of that team that puts it all together. You can do it on your own. Um, you probably have an idea of what you want your program to look like, but having others come in on the side, um, I have to admit, I kind of had in my head what the program might look like, but this focus group has really helped for me to have to um, more clearly define and articulate how and why we do things the way we do. Um, the focus group also helps you meet the needs of the culture of your particular county. And as I indicated, we have a very large homeschool population in our county. And so that definitely has a cultural impact um, on our entire county for businesses, youth organizations, and the like. It also helps us to be able to prioritize programming, and it also helps us with identifying some of our local resource people. So um, when we use that group, 
looking at here's the problem now how do we go about fixing it um one of the things that when we first started with them um with this issue of how do we place kids in clubs and how you manage the paperwork on it um one of the things that came out within about the first half hour 45 minutes of us working with this focus group um they said well have you considered having a survey monkey to be able to gather their information and it was one of those oh my goodness the lights come on so now we have a future 4-hers um, profile that we put together that helps us to know what projects they're looking for and it helps give us a management tool for keeping track of all of those kids that want to be in 4-H. We also have one for future leaders and we have one for 4-H alumni and we have another that we use as a club profile so that we can be able to tell families and be able to share with families, well, this particular small animal club, you can count on them meeting on the second Monday of the month. They do elect officers. They are involved in community service projects. Um, they don't do fundraising. Um, the majority of the members in this club are middle school girls, which is really helpful to know when you've got um, you know, middle school boys or elementary kids that are looking for a club and don't want to have to be part of a group that's made up of all older kids. Um, it's also allowed us to be able to help involve folks who have skills that they'd like to share but don't want to manage a uh, year-round club. It allows us um, for the kids who are in the program to be able to do more in different projects without having to join another club. And it's also allowed us to be able to um, fill in the gaps in our static exhibits where we've had no clubs to be able to refer kids to, um, particularly some of those low enrollment ones um, with outdoor exploration and some of the nature and natural resources programs um, that we've been able to fill with uh, utilizing STEP programs. So um, how do we deliver this? Well. Um, it's been a wide variety of ways, and this has kind of evolved um, over the years as we've had this. Um, we've had one-shot programs where it's a one hour and a half program um, in the evening and, and it's over and done with. We've had multi-week series. Um, we have a set of calligraphy classes that we teach in a three-class series, and we do it regularly Um usually one to two times a year. And that's been a really positive way to be able to um, put those together. Um, spring break week is one that since we've been doing it, it maxes out um, each year. So uh, those non-school days or vacation days have been great times to be able to do uh, classes. I've worked specifically with schools. We have one of the remote rural schools that does fun Fridays. They don't have class, but they still have um, their cafeteria and their kitchens open for those kids to be able to come in for free and reduced lunch and, and breakfast. Um, and then they pick up their backpacks to be able to take home over the weekend. Um, so we found those have been very effective ways to be able to reach them. Um, also, working with the homeschool audience and the homeschool consortiums with being able to help supplement them and to be able to um, expand their offerings in many of the sciences. One of my um, office cohorts um, has been a player in developing the dabble and dissection curriculum that is going through uh, National 4-H Council right now, and she worked with the homeschool consortiums doing um, a lot of, of dissection workshops with them to enhance their science and biology programs that they wouldn't be able to offer otherwise. During the summers, we also do summer day camp programs with a project focus. We do some stuff with school enrichment and after school. And this has ended up um, going from those single shot programs to now where we actually um, have developed educational tracks. So they're around a specific project area. So um, photography, um, arts, 
fiber arts, um, outdoor explorers. Um, we do an intro to animals workshop on a variety of, of animals where we introduce kids to them so that they um, are able to see uh, what they would be doing in that particular project. Oops, there we go. Um, so as I mentioned, it allows kids to be able to get involved in other clubs um, that we haven't been able to play some clubs or want to do additional projects. It allows kids to be able to try new things. Um, I utilize older youth all the time with STEP classes. Um, I've had them teaching and sharing some of the projects and things that they've worked on. Um, and they certainly um, help with doing registration and set up and clean up and then um, supporting and, and being a helper um, within the classes. And they're just priceless um, in that role and have just been a tremendous help for us in doing these programs. Um, we found that with STEP, because of the short time commitment, it's been able to um, help us to recruit a whole different realm of volunteers and resource people. So we're able to bring somebody in who does <clears throat> say needle felting as part of the farmer's market. And we've been able to involve them coming in and um, teaching a particular subject matter area where they may do it in a one-shot program or they may come back and support the kids and be a resource leader for those. And um, that's been a, just a, a really tremendous resource for us to be able to have those folks who have that subject matter knowledge who can be able to help us with some of those areas. Um, for instance, knitting, I know just enough to be dangerous with those needles, um, but I don't know all of the idiosyncrasies of um, managing lace and doing all of the stuff that the kids may want to do with the project area. So I can get them started, but many times we're able to bring those resource leaders in to be able to help with a particular area. And then um, I've got a really good rapport with those people that we've been able to bring in. And I've been able to involve them in um, if we've got a group of kids that are needing some additional help, then I can be able to bring them in to be able to do a specialty class. So for instance, um, we had a, a bunch of girls that were wanting to um, experiment with doing um, with knitting and doing lace. And so we were able to bring in, uh, bring back the knitting resource person to be able to help with that particular project area. It certainly helped us to be able to increase our enrollment and our fair participation. Um, you can pretty much go through our exhibit building and be able to see what some of our step classes have been um, by the number of, of exhibits in a particular area um, and some of the contests that they may be involved in. It also allows us to be able to focus on new and current ideas where we may not have a curriculum within the state to be able to help support that. <clears throat> so that's been a great way um, to be able to, to incorporate more cutting edge stuff. Um, and we utilize um, Pinterest as our friend um, to be able to bring in those new ideas. And these episodic volunteers, um, the evaluations that I've done with them, just have a blast with teaching these kids. They love being able to come in and work with the kids and then they don't have to continue to lead a club and they don't have to continue to figure out, oh, what are we going to do tonight at 4-H, et cetera. So that's been a great way to be able to involve those leaders who um, or resource people who have the knowledge and skills, but don't have the time nor the interest to do a year-round project club. So um, when we worked at developing these educational tracks, um, I would have to say probably um, a good solid two-thirds um, of our 4-H enrollment right now um, particularly with the impacts with COVID, have been with our Clover Buds and our junior members. 
Um, so there's a tremendous group of that um, fifth, uh, five years old through um, essentially 15 um, that we're looking at that we have just a tremendous group there that we uh, need to be able to have program offerings for them. So these are some of the educational tracks that we've done over the last few years. Um, Cloverbud is always popular. And actually what we've done with that is we have the set day of the week. It's on the third Tuesday of the month. And we do two classes um, the same night, same location, same project. So we have a, a Cloverbud class that meets um, at four o'clock and they do their stuff. And then we have another group that comes in at six. And so that way, we're already set up. We already have all of the supplies and materials there. I've already got the teen helpers, but it allows us to be able to meet the needs of those kids who may have um, a babysitter or a parent who's home after school and can be able to make the four o'clock class. And it also allows us then <clears throat> to be able to meet the needs of those parents who get done with work at five and they need to be able to get the kids home and get a snack and then they can bring them in and have them ready to go by six. So that's been a real positive way for us to be able to um, manage um, and to be able to um, keep that program going. Um, let's see, I have a question here. Okay, um, the information on the, the pause and clause. So um, the educational tracks and then some of the successes as a result of our um, step classes, we've had some of these that have actually turned into clubs. Um, the CAT project is one of the projects that we have out here. And um, we ended up with um, going from um, two cats at fair to nine this year. Um, and then um, we have the pocket pets. So the exotic pets were the additional members. And so what we did was we just took the, the kids were in, that were in the cat project, because um, you know cats are kind of like bicycles, what kid doesn't have one um, kind of thing. Um, and so we've been able to um, keep that going. Unfortunately, the leader of that particular group ended up moving out of the county for a job. So um, <clears throat> I'm hoping we've got a group of um, older teens that I think are going to go ahead and take it on. Um, and one of their parents is willing to be the adult person that's that's there for them. But um, the older youth then would lead the 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 cat club. And um, they do, just like you do in the other um, project areas, they do showmanship. They do, uh, they have a well cat record that they manage. Um, they have a decorated cage that they do. Um, they have both cat treats and cat toys. Um, that they can be able to enter that's of a recipe or an idea that they've put together. Um, and then we do more of an advanced show and tell where they get to tell about their project and what they've learned in the project area. So it incorporates in um, an informal public presentation with the project that they can, those are all some of the classes that they can do as part of FAIR. Um, and then those have just evolved into um, from the the animals 101. Um, we did the the feline series, and that's ended up turning into that cat project. And then um, spring break, we've done um, woodworking a number of years, and last year we did leather craft, and um, we have a large number of kids who were interested in that. So. Um, 
And we've initiated doing some work with Tandy Leather Company out of Portland to be able to come down and we'll do a regional leather craft group. And then we will, um, we're going to see what we can be able to do with some of the smaller topics and some of the smaller projects to be able to do them virtually. So um, they have key rings and bookmarks and um, luggage tags that are pretty easy to be able to do in one shot setting. <clears throat> the biggest challenge with the leather craft is having the stamps to do them. So um, it would be really helpful to be able to have the um, the office setting to be able to have the kids share some of those leather craft tools to be able to do those. So those are some of the topics that have ended up coming up with. Um, I've not been able to find someone who's been willing to take on the liability of having a bunch of kids in their wood shop. So our woodworking, um, I've had to say that <clears throat> what we've ended up having to do with that is I've worked with groups of kids, small groups of kids who have come in and cut the parts um, and cut the wood pieces for us. And then we've done the class. So the woodworking has not necessarily been, <clears throat> y'all come in and we're gonna develop a porch swing and put together a porch swing. It's not that kind of thing. It's been more um, step stools, bookshelves, um, toolkit, birdhouses, those kinds of things where we've been able to get them involved in those kinds of projects. And that's been a very positive thing. So um, there we go. So as I've mentioned, some of the future tracks that we're looking at, um, we're doing some stuff with young entrepreneurs, uh, woodworking leather, as I mentioned, um, sewing, we do some stuff with vet science, um, photography, wood carving. Um, we're very fortunate in that we have um, we have an, our extension homemaker, she did um, a holiday fair back before doing a holiday bazaar was the in thing to do. Um, I think they're pushing close to 60 years on um, our holiday fair. And so we have um, the Capital Wood Carvers come over from Salem and our vendors at the holiday fair. And um, I found that recruiting these resource people to come in and teach us a topic has been a really positive thing to be able to um, have them come in and be able to teach and share um, some of the things that they're working on and to be able to teach them of our classes. So um, woodworking is one that has come out of that. Um, astrology is a, a group that we have that's a group of older folks who've been here in the county that are really into telescopes and they've been willing to share with the kids um, some of the projects and things that they've done um, within our um, program area. And then um, we also have a huge group of um, guys who play with their toys um, with the remote control cars and planes. Um, we easily have, um, an adult group of folks who fly their planes and do controlled um, radio controlled cars, um, 100 some 100 plus membership on those. Um, and then we've also been able to use them, as I've said, on um, some of the intro to animals, such as bunny basics, ticks 101, uh, dealing with pocket pets, um, and then um, We've done the Fiend Line, which has turned into the Cat Club. Um, likewise, Man's Best Friend in Dealing with Dogs. And um, each year, we have a very large group that ends up doing the Horseless Horse Project. Um, so that's where the kids get to learn about them whenever they don't have access to a horse. Um, and I saw a question in the chat, how often do they meet? These educational tracks um, have been set up once a month. Um, but some of these classes, like the calligraphy, 
is helpful to be able to do in three session format. So it might be three weeks on Thursday nights, we do calligraphy. So it depends on where the holes in the schedule are, uh, availability of the instructor, et cetera. And typically we're looking at these educational tracks will be seven sessions. There'll be in October, November, we take off December with the holidays and then it's January through May. Um, so a total of five, two in the fall and then um, the five after the first of the year. So we've had great success with the tracks. It really helps families to be able to plan ahead on working on their, their calendars and people who have busy schedules. It's been really helpful for us within our office because then we have consistent dates that we're using the conference room so that other office staff, if they're looking at doing you know, a master gardener educational series, then they know when those holes are gonna be, when they can be able to come in and do those kinds of classes. It ensures that you've got meeting space availability. Um, it also allows office staff to know when there are open spots in the calendar, as we also have um, outside organizations that come in and use our space occasionally. Um, but as I mentioned, the best part about all of this is we have something that's going on pretty much any time of the year that we can have somebody walk in off the street and have something to offer them within the 4-H program. And um, to me, I think that's priceless because we really have to have a way to be able to get the kids involved in the program before we lose them. Um, what are some of the issues with our adults? Well, um, as I've mentioned, the episodic volunteers, um, these are folks who are willing to share their skills but not take on the club. Um, one of my recruiting tools for this has been utilizing our holiday fair, fair vendors. <clears throat> They've been just a tremendous support for us. Um, we have an excellent working relationship with our vendors um, and we have um, we have 130 different booth spaces with that. So we have a wide variety of vendors and they're as just like they're having to come up with new ideas each year, then they're bringing those new ideas to us within the program. Um, I also try to make some time um, during the fair itself to actually go over and look at the open class exhibitors. Um, and if I catch them after hours, then I can be able <laughs> to get a hold of the exhibit tags and open them up and know who those people are. Um, and they put their uh, email address on there. And so I'm able to contact a lot of those open class exhibitors to be able to um, find people who have skills in a particular area that might be willing to help us out. So for instance, um, one of the, the people that I was able to locate through the open class exhibitors um, is a woman who does a bunch of stuff with making tie dyed um, uh, tablecloths. So she gets uh, the white tablecloths and she does all kinds of fabulous designs and such um, to be able to do tie dyeing with uh, these white tablecloths and they're just stunning. They're really beautiful. And so she's come in and shared some new ideas for doing tie dye t-shirts using some of the techniques that she's been able to bring about. Um, and just a side hint for you, if you do tie dye, um, and you hate fighting with the rubber bands, she ends up using those um, royal blue and black carpenter clamps that hold the stuff together. They've got the, they're a much heavier and tighter clothespin. So when you're trying to put together uh, big masses of fabric to hold it together, she's had lots of really good success with those, um, those clamps that you use for woodworking. Um, it's also been a way where we've, I've had adults say, but I want to learn how to do pickled beets. 
or I want to learn how to be able to um, to do some of the food preservation or some of the um, we do a, a Sunday night family dinners that we do that's on um, international foods. So I don't turn them away. They ne don't necessarily have the skills to be able to add, but um, I let them come learn with the understanding that you're going to come back and help and volunteer um, and be able to help us out after you've learned how to do this. And so Again, that's been a wonderful cadre of volunteers to be able to have them come in and help with stuff. So um, I had a small group of ladies, I think there were ended up three to five of them. Three of them kept with it on the knitting and they've stuck with it for about six years now. And um, they're just tremendous help with helping the kids with the, the knitting project. And um, they come in and really enjoy the time when they knit together. And so <clears throat> it's been a great way to be able to involve adult volunteers who want to be able to learn, don't have the skills to be able to teach, but they can be able to put up and set up and take down tables and chairs just fine. So um, that's been a great way to be able to involve them. Also, um, look in house, who's the, the um, person on the other side of the wall or on the other side of the cubicle from you. Uh, we utilize our master food preservers, our master gardeners and our woodland managers to be able to help share some of those skills. And that helps them with um, needing to be able to show what they've done in working with the youth population um, in doing these kinds of um, exhibits and uh, learning how to do some of these things. Also look at some of your local groups. As I mentioned, the Capital Wood Carvers are re uh, remote control uh, planes, the Quilters Guild, those folks have been um, just tremendous help for us. And again, they have no problem coming in and helping us. They just don't want to have to volunteer year round. Um, and our local businesses have been terrific help. We have um, our clothing stores, Grandma's Attic, Tandy Leather as a corporation um, has been great help. Um, we have the Sip and Paint where we have a large number of um, wineries out here and they'll do a winery night where they'll do a flight of wines and then um, one of the artisans will come in and they all paint the same picture. And so those have been great um, fillers for businesses, but those same instructors have no problem coming in and helping teach kids some of the things I'm working with acrylics and watercolor, et cetera. Um, Photostop is our local photography workshop or business. Um, and they've just been tremendous help. And the photography group that they have, that they sponsor, has been a great source for us with um, photography resources. Bead Shop um, has been a great resource for some of the jewelry making. And don't forget our local vets are a tremendous resource as well. And then looking at bringing back some of our former 4-Hers to come in and share their skills. Um, <clears throat> glass etching, um, the stuff that they're doing with um, old books where you fold the paper and it does whatever the, the name or the word might be. Um, we had one of our, our former 4-Hers who for her wedding, she did those books with you know, love, faith, family, those kinds of words um, in the books. And then she came back and helped teach it for us. Right. So what's the reality of trying to do this project? Um, well, um, I'm going to have to say not all of it is pretty and not all of it is easy. It does come with its challenges. Um, initially, it can be tremendously time consuming to pull all of these pieces together and to be able to um, make it work. But somehow it always seems to work. Um, and I have to say, I would have to indicate that 
I think is a result of flying by the seat of my pants in teaching and having to pick up the pieces and, and teach classes within the STEP program has made me a better teacher overall because I really had to learn how to um, just roll with the punches and make it work. And so that's been a positive thing for me personally. Um, also, you've got to be prepared if a class idea flops for you. Um, I put in here marionettes because um, this was one of the projects we were going to do as part of spring break. And I was really worried it was just going to be a bomb. Um, and what they do is um, you make marionette, marionettes out of toilet paper rolls. And we did those as part of, of spring break. And I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised. It was not a flop. If anything, it was one of the it was one of the highest rated classes we had that week. And essentially, what they do is they decorate the um, the the toilet paper rolls, and those are tied to with yarn are tied to um, tongue depressors, and they can be able to make moving marionettes. And I utilized off of one of the the um, craft blogs, I used their videos that they had, training videos for a cat and a dog, so that they could be able to see and kind of spark their ideas of what it might look like. And lo and behold, I didn't have a single singular kid who did a cat or a dog. We had all kinds of stuff, and it ended up being just a tremendous success. Um, probably two of the, the greatest ones were I had one young lady ended up doing <clears throat> a rainbow inchworm. So she, each section of the worm was a different color attached with a different yarn, and it was absolutely adorable. Um, I had another 4 h -er who did dairy goats, and she did a dairy goat complete with an udder. Um, <laughs> So the, they really come up with uh, very creative ideas. And um, I really encourage that creativity and exploring. Um, in most of my classes, we don't have blue skies and the, the grass isn't green. It doesn't have to be green. The dirt isn't brown and the tulip doesn't have to be red. So um, it really lends itself to a lot of, of creativity. Um, you've got to be able to handle lots of details, not only the teaching of it, but managing the supplies. Um, if you end up having one of the kids that was going to help you do registration that night ends up having too much homework, then you've got to figure out how to be able to pick up registration and do registrations along with teaching it and that kind of uh, thing that happens. Um, so again, you've got to learn how to, to, to make it all work. Um, so we had been using, um, what were we using? We were using Qualtrics um, as our registration and sign up, and it's not working. Um, it's not recording and transferring the folks over. And I'm not sure if it's the way we put it into it or not. So we are looking at different kinds of registration pieces, Eventbrite, and, and we've, we've tried out about four different programs right now and don't like any of them. So we may end up just going back to a plain old Excel spreadsheet is what we may end up using. Um, some other things. Um, our 4-H association ends up heavily, heavily subsidizing these. And we do have, um, we have a fee for kids who are already in the 4-H program and have already paid their 4-H membership fee. And then we have non-4-H member fees, which they pay one to $2 more. And um, the cost on our classes um, range anywhere from, um, $2 to, um, I think the most expensive we did was, it was a $5 flat fee, and then they had to buy kits for the more ex expensive ones. And that's how we did the stuff with um, 
leather craft. So those kids who wanted to pick a particular billfold or they wanted to, to um, you know, they needed to have a longer belt, then they had a um, different fee than the other kids for the project that they worked on. So um, it also takes a lot of storage. So you've got to be creative with that storage and um, also be thinking ahead of what other kinds of projects can be able to use these same supplies. And then you're always on the lookout for great class ideas and, and cheap ideas. And, and it's really quite funny. Um, we've now gotten, um, we have a county Facebook page and we have people who pretty much regularly um, will put new ideas <laughs> for new classes that they'll go ahead and add as a post on our Facebook page. If you consider doing this, this would be fun. <laughs> So, um, and that's just from our general public and our followers within 4-H. So they've been a great resource for us to be able to um, utilize those people in helping us with that. So some of the unexpected results um, as a result of that, um, I mentioned the stuff with spring break. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, our Sunday night family dinners. Um, I did a focus group with the foods kids to find out what they wanted to learn. <clears throat> because when we first started doing our super chefs program, we were maxing classes out with waiting lists. And then all of a sudden they dropped significantly and we needed, wanted to find out why. And so we pulled together a group to look at it. And one of the things we were looking at doing was actually helping kids with food preparation skills. So getting them, um, helping them to understand what it takes to put the family dinner on the table. And then um, from there, it evolved into wanting to do a bunch of stuff with international foods. And so Sunday nights, we do um, usually about four to five a year. Um, Sunday night, we'll do a family dinner and kids pay $5, adults pay $7. And we can take usually up to 40 people. And then we have all of these learning stations and all of these recipes that are happening all at once. And then we come back and kind of, um, reflect on what worked, what you do a little bit differently. Everybody gets the recipes. Um, everybody gets to taste what everybody else did. Um, I have some of our ambassadors and some of our older youth who help with the class. Um, I've had some of them take on doing a teaching component as part of the class. So we did one on... Um, we did one on, on Greece and Greek cooking. And one of the kids did, um, we, well, we had two kids that took on Greece to be able to do the educational piece. And so um, one did the um, their break from the European Union and what impact it's had on their financial economy. Um, and then some of the political uprising that was occurring in Greece at the time. Um, so that was a great way to be able to incorporate and tie in some of those educational pieces. So those kids who put the time into doing those can then do a public presentation and or a poster and educational display as part of FAIR. Um, and many times they've also used those in some of their, um, their history and government classes as well. So um, that has ended up being just a tremendous um, event with the Sunday night family dinners and pulling those off. Um, some of the other things with this, um, I've mentioned open class exhibitors and the holiday vendors, the classes have turned into clubs. Um, we've had sufficient numbers with clover buds that we've had to give them their own day. So um, instead of having clover, clover buds come in when we do all of the rest of the judging, they have their own specific day prior to fair. 
um, which has allowed us to be able to have much quieter setting for them so um, the nerves don't get the best of them as clover buds for their first time judging. Um, this program has been a tremendous way to be able to do um, solve some of the problem areas that we've had. Um, I know you probably don't have these kinds of challenging leaders, but if you do, um, it's a super way to be able to involve some of those leaders that you don't dare fire them because they're gonna cause you more grief if you fire them than if you can keep them busy and out of trouble and give them a job out in the hinterlands. And um, the step classes have, have really been able to help with involving some of those um, challenging leaders in those roles. Um, it's allowed us to be able to incorporate some of the STEM and STEAM programming into just about every class. And we do a lot with using um, our project advancements and our judges' explanation cards and the check sheets have worked great for helping educate the kids on what the judge will be looking for and how do you identify a quality project, et cetera. So um, with this, um, we had mentioned that um, some of the goals with this were to learn how we went about developing it, um, the steps that we put together in um, being able to come up with this program idea, and how we've been able to use these short-term programs to be able to fill in the gaps for our enrollment. So it's just been a tremendous way for us to be able to incorporate um, all of those outside resource people um, and be able to do some really fun classes. Um, and let's face it, when you're a 4-H agent and you don't have any time to do anything for yourself, this is a great way to be able to introduce some of those projects where you get to be able to do um, one of the ones I wanted to do has always been, um, you know, that the red uh, heart that you do it at Valentine's Day. Um, we did the red hearts um, and you do felt circles and you put those in. I always thought those were so pretty. So by golly, we did it as a as a heart heart art project. So I got to finally get my red Valentine's heart done. Um, so it's a great way to be able to learn yourself and to be able to do some of those things when you really don't have time to do them. So um, it's been a tremendous way for me to be able to learn things like cake decorating and jewelry making that I'd never have time any other way. So um, questions, comments, what can I help you with in some of our general discussion here in the last four minutes we've got? Did I Thanks, get all Susie. There was, there was a question in the chat about, um, are these events weekly or monthly? Okay. Um, with those, it all depends on the topic. Um, the education tracks are once a month um, on a set day. So second Tuesday of the month is such and such. The last Monday of the month is fiber arts. Um, then we've had ones where they've been one-shot programs, which are typically the animal 101s and the vet science ones. Um, and then some of the other classes and topics lend themselves to having the training um, in, in a multi-week series. So for instance, the calligraphy we do in a three-week series. So um, <clears throat> it can be, you know, three Thursdays in a row kind of thing. So it really depends on the topic for what it is that we end up um, carrying out and, and incorporating in. That was a good question, thanks. And I think I covered costs um, on, we do, I suppose we have some you could probably do for free, but I found whenever you charge something, they show up more. There's more commitment to show up, um, even if it's just a dollar. And um, I also, I have a number of um, low income families that have some large uh, number of kids. And so if they help me with set up and tear down and it's not too expensive of a, of a project, I'll either give them free or reduced 
because they're just, it's a family and they're just tremendously helpful in doing all of the setup and cleanup. Um, and they do a great job helping me with, um, you know, they'll mop down the, the meeting room after we've done a disastrous something or other in the horticulture project and we have dirt everywhere kind of thing. Um, so yes, if they're willing to help me with mop, <laughs> mop in the conference room floor, by golly, you can come participate for free. I have no problem with that. So I'll make those kinds of arrangements with folks. Uh, do staff attend all the programs or are they just volunteers at the event? It depends on the topic. I've got um, some project areas where I have volunteers who've taken it on. Um, my favorite age group are middle schoolers. And I am not really, really good with little, little kids. So um, I've recruited somebody to do clover butts. And so they do just the clover butt thing. I come in and help. Um, I still teach a couple of them, um, but I don't have the responsibility every single week to do the two sessions. And I filled in for her a number of times when she can do the four o'clock, but can't do the six or vice versa. Um, so we, the thing is we uh, do staff attend. I attend quite a few of them, but I can't make them to all of them. The key piece is we have to have an enrolled 4-H volunteer, um, typically two adults who attend a program that are um, the trained certified volunteers that can be able to certify um, or supervise those classes. Um, and then collecting fees ahead of time. Um, we've done it both ways. I've actually found that it's been easier to just collect the fees at the time um, because with um, COVID and with our staffing and budget, we have limited office hours now. And so uh, we've not been able to um, have walk-ins to be able to do registration. And our 4-H Association doesn't want to set up a credit card system. So um, that's kind of where we're at on having to collect the fees at the class. Okay. Hey, other questions? Well, thanks, Susie. If there are other questions, I just have a few closing things if people are thinking um, about questions, but know that you will, um, once the recording is posted on the ESP site, all of you will receive it as well. Um, if Susie's um, amenable, I will PDF her PowerPoint and attach that as well, and you'll have her contact information. So if you have further questions, I'm sure she would entertain any emails um, that you might have uh, follow-up questions as well. So, um, and just a reminder, um, you should be getting some um, information. So our next uh, webinar, ESP webinar, is uh, March I had the date up here, March 22nd at 1 p.m. So uh, developing community partnerships. So you should see some information coming from the National ESP office about signing up for that webinar as, we as well as the rest of them that we have set up through, um, through June of this year. So thank you, Susie, for your time. We appreciate it. And no uh, if you have questions, like I said, I'll send out a follow-up email with... Um, some information as well as Susie's contact because I'm sure she would be more than happy to talk to you in more detail at any point in time. So absolutely. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks, Travis. You're welcome.